Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Let's Talk Parks. My name is Becky, and this is Dustin, and we are so excited to be talking about making our playgrounds and parks more inclusive with innovative design and kind of the next generation of playgrounds. So I'm really excited. Dustin and I actually talked, we were thinking it was over two years ago, like back on season one of the podcast about playground design and, and trends. And I thought it would be a really fun follow up to catch up a couple years later and talk about maybe how things have changed, um, talk about the benefits and rewards of playgrounds, because we know how so much has changed and so much has become more valued when it comes to local parks. And then also to talk about how we can make our playgrounds and parks more inclusive. So not only for people with disabilities or, or physical or sensory or whatever it may be, but also around, you know, how do we make our, our playgrounds more inviting for people of, you know, of color and of different, um, you know, of, of all different cultures and races and, you know, wherever they may be in their life or community, wherever, we just want to make sure that those playgrounds are inclusive. So I brought Dustin on the show to talk about these things and um, Dustin, thank you for being here. I want you to go ahead and start by telling us a little bit more about your story and your role because you currently work at Playground Creations and would love to know more about that. Thanks, Becky. Yeah, uh, I work at Playground Creations where, guess what? We make beautiful playgrounds. Who would have thought? Uh, the path I got to working in the playground and park space, the commercial design and build space is pretty fun. I've uh, been working in recreation for half my life, starting as a camp counselor and, um, you know, being a child at 15, essentially disciplining other kids uh, or other parents' kids and mm -hmm. like guiding them through fun activities at summer camp all the way to uh, doing wilderness therapy with adjudicated youth um, to private uh, ski instruction and raft guiding. And then I found myself uh, in playgrounds working for uh, a few different playground companies before making a move to represent landscape structures and joining the team at Playground Creations uh, here in Atlanta. And I get to uh, help, you know, cities, schools, churches, whoever is taking care of little ones or providing community spaces um, to design something that's beautiful, that's functional, that's inviting and uh, is all about fun. That's, that's what my job is about, is trying to uh, provide wonderful community spaces that allow families to make memories that are hopefully positive. Um, but yeah, that's what it's all about. So it is what it's all about. I mean, that's what the show is all about. It's all around, you know, parks and recreation professionals and like helping our communities enjoy their spaces more. And so it's fun to talk to someone on the design side of things and actually building those spaces um, because, you know, there's a lot of coordination involved between local agencies and, uh, you know, companies um, like Playground Creations and Landscape Structures, like trying to take that community vision and turn it into life. And I think, you know, over the last couple of, or actually 18 months or so, I think more and more people have realized the immense value of local parks and playgrounds because for so long we had, you know, for myself, I had to walk to my local parks because I, you know, didn't feel like getting in my car to go across town and there's just so much unknown. And I think so many more people did that. They just walked to their parks, their local parks, whether it's in their neighborhood or down the street. And those spaces became an integral part of their day. Um, you know, for anyone with young kids, it was like, I need to get out of the house. I have to get out of the house for my own sanity. And I chose to go to the park. And I think a lot has changed. And you can tell us about that, you know, how things have changed kind of in the playground world. And things are becoming so much more innovative and fun. Um, and, you know, I really would just love to kind of open up this conversation around what you see are some of the, the risks that people are still having to navigate in their head 
when it comes to letting their children go play? And then what are some of the rewards that come from our playgrounds that are so often overlooked? Yeah. Uh, wow. What a wonderful question. Thank you. Let's try to unpack that. Uh, I think definitely echoing what you said about the last 18 months changing how we view parks and playgrounds specifically. You know, parks became a place to relax, a place to gather for meals with friends, um, our fitness studios, our our jungle gyms for the kids. You know, it when when you know as we've been living through the development of um, understanding COVID-19, the pandemic and how the virus was behaving, you know, at the beginning, all surfaces were considered like high risk areas. So they were closing playgrounds, like the actual playground equipment. Um, and then this more research came out and it's like, oh, okay, ultraviolet light kills the virus. So more people are encouraged to be outside and to meet outside. So that's, you know, even affected how restaurants started performing, taking over the parking lot and doing outside dining so they could stay in business. So um, the the benefits of the park have been, um, I think, uh, life saving, mind saving, you know, g giving people an opportunity to just let their guard down for an hour or two when they're bombarded by all these different risks where we're not trusting our own body our a stranger's body, the biome, the bacteria, viruses, all that we're all breathing in and out. The park was a space where we could at least trust in the statistics, right? That there's enough ultraviolet light and there's enough wind and fresh air to allow you to congregate with people, strangers again, and smile at them with your mask off, you know, and like, and like be comfortable and have that sense of normalcy. Um, but like the playground itself has, has been and always will be a place for risk, for risky behavior. Um, and I think that's super important when we are thinking of the, the development of young children, right? Um, the playground is, is critical for kids to develop uh, emotional skills and social skills, creative thinking skills, and that scaffolding that they teach themselves on the playground is going to help them out as adults. Um, so when a child is first learning how to walk, you know, it's not long before they're running. Okay. And then we're, uh, as I'm not a parent, I know you're a new parent. So congratulations, right? You're, I'm sure keeping up with, uh, your little boy running around and trying to make sure there aren't any sharp corners at head height or, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're, we want to, we want to try to make a space as child friendly as possible. Um, and you know, we can't, we can't nerf everything. Um, there has to be a place for risk. And I think a playground is a great spot for that. Um, think of the, the motor skills that are developed from free play on a playground. When you start at two, three, four years old, you're just learning how to navigate the world with this giant head that's throwing off your center of balance. You know, you're falling down all the time. Um, that's important. Those every time that kid falls, they're they're learning something. They're teaching themselves about how their body works. That's proprioception. You know how your body works in three dimensions. Um, the the risk reward skills start to come into play when they're starting to go up a, a climbing ladder you know they they see the slide that's the reward they want that zip they want that speed they know they can have that fun sensation on the slide but they've got to figure it out how are they going to get there are they going to go up the easy stairs they can totally go up the easy stairs or they can follow their older brother or an older kid up a little more challenging climbing feature right and maybe halfway up there they get a little freaked out they get scared and they've got to deal with these emotions that are coming from inside that maybe they haven't felt before so these playgrounds are wonderful spots wonderful spaces for oh man just a plethora of lessons that don't need to be written out or spoken to they're going to happen naturally um 
and and I think uh yeah, I was uh I don't want to out you here. I'm 34. I'm about to be 35. How old are you? I'm 30. Woo, all right. Yeah. So here we are. <laughs> yeah, we made it. Um yeah. and, and I feel like maybe you, maybe I'm speaking for you too. Maybe we were one of the last uh, few kids that were raised with the streetlight rule. Mm. They were kind of that free, that free range kid that got to run around, got to walk down the street by ourselves with a, our gang of friends to the park playground, yes. you know? Yeah. Cool. You know, so that, that kind of, uh, that's a risk that our mm. parents were willing to take that I don't think parents are willing to take now. Um, but I'm not, I don't want to speak for all parents. It's just a overgeneralization, but it is, but it's true. And there's so much freedom that I remember experiencing as a child and as kind of in my early teens around, you know, playing in the cul-de-sac, playing until it the sun went down. And then in the summers, like there were nights where we would stay out until like nine or 10 and like do a whole, whole game, you know, all everybody in the neighborhood would come together. And we would play just like a manhunt, which was, you know, you had to be there to be there. But um, it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hide and seek is basically that. Um, but it was a good time. And I feel like there there was a lot of lessons that you learn when you're given that independence. Definitely. And that, that's, a, that's applied to playgrounds too. Um, and when parents see uh, playground equipment that kind of makes them – tight when they when they see their kid climbing up on something that they feel like maybe they shouldn't um know that the playground is is designed for that type of risk you know the playgrounds of uh the the late 1800s you know or during the industrial revolution in england right that's where some of the first playgrounds were built they are like 30 feet tall and they were just 90 degree angles of pipe that kids could just climb up to the top with 10 foot tall monkey bars or 10 foot off the ground, 10 feet, 10 feet high monkey bars over concrete, you know? Um, and those, those kids learned their own risk. They learned from the mistakes of their colleagues and, you know, they, they understand that, Oh, uh, I'm not going to do what they did because they fell down and now they're, they're hurt. Um, but, but a modern playground is designed with, um, a lot of special consideration to risks and hazards um, that should prevent any, uh, that should prevent most like life-threatening injuries. You still might get a, an, a broken arm or a broken ankle or, you know, sprain something. But with modern surfacing, with modern design, the life-threatening head injuries that could happen on a playground, um, should be mitigated to where a child at it, 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 the appropriate age, right? Cause different playground equipment is designed mm -hmm. for different ages um, should be able to navigate that playground freely um, and be able to do whatever they want to challenge by choice, right? Figure it out on their own. Um, and there's a lot of, there's, there's a lot of pride and um, self-confidence boosting self-esteem, the sense of mastery that, you know, the first time, a kid goes across a monkey bar, they probably fall because it's hard. You know, the grip strength, holding your entire upper body with just your little hands when you're four or five years old is tough. But imagine coming back to the playground your second time, your third time trying the monkey bars and you finally make it all the way across the monkey bars completely independent by yourself. That is a huge moment for a kid. Um, and it is hard. And the kids know it's hard. So when, when they can do it, they're going to feel really good about themselves. I still feel good about myself when I go across a monkey bar. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Harder every year. I know. I don't think I've ever been able to actually do that. Um, uh -oh. <laughs> Challenge. Challenge accepted. I need to go back and try again. Um, but yeah, it's like the sense of mastery. And I love, I love that approach to it. It's like, it's something that every time you go to the playground, they, they get it a little bit more. You know, it's mm -hmm. like the first time I took my son, who is about to turn two, to the playground, he, you know, would be crawling 
up these stairs or like across the bridge and I'd be following him every step of the way and like really nervous and holding his hand and all of that. Granted, he was probably a little young for that playground equipment, right? So that's like a key point is that, yeah, age appropriate is important. But, um, you know, and now he's getting to the point where it's like he wants to show me what he can do on his own. And he'll turn around and wave at me and like, you know, he'll, he wants to go down the slide by himself. And so it's, it's really rewarding on a parent's end to see that satisfaction that comes from learning that new thing and experiencing that fun. But there is that, the, the painful anxiety that also comes with watching them learn or like watching them trip and almost really mess up, you know? So yeah, there's a lot of like emotional, I think the other day you were saying it, like emotional tension that comes with that experience. Yeah. Um, not being a parent and being being on like the professional side of child development, youth development. I've always been like an older brother, enthusiastic uncle figure trying to encourage a child to push through the stress. But like, you can do it. You got it. You know, that kind of stuff. Um, and I would just encourage all parents to, to try to embrace that type of mentality when you go to a playground, um, in, uh, I don't want to should on anybody cause it's, <laughs> I don't want to, I'm not a parent. I don't understand. Like, you know, that is a part of you that's toddling across the playground. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's like your pride and joy. That's everything you've worked for, for the last two years plus nine months, you know, you're going to take care of your child. Right. Um, but let's not do a disservice to our kids by preventing them from learning valuable resilience and grit that they learn on their own that we don't need to talk about or need to like be full face, you know, like mm -hmm. when you fall down, make sure they're okay. Get them back on the playground, get them, get them up and moving again. You know, um, I think there's just a lot of uh, benefits to the accepting of a challenge, even as a child, um, that it could also be beneficial to a parent, like accepting I am letting my child go on the playground alone for the first time. Like when when your little boy is uh, when you when you decide because you, you are the ultimate you know, gatekeeper of this child's behavior and like what they can and can't do until they're old enough to sprint away from you. You can't keep up. Right. Um, you're going to know when your kid is ready to navigate the playground by themselves, uh, unassisted. Um, so that's another challenge by choice for parents. You know, like when you feel comfortable, let your kids go and let them play with other kids because the older kids on the playground, they're not going to just like knock your little kid out of the way. You're going to see these kids work together. And, you know, there's there's a lot of social interaction and a lot of um, uh, peer to peer uh, coordination. Imagine all the kids lining up for the slide. Right. For the most part, you're going to see kids work together and say like, oh, OK, it's your turn. Like, wait, take your time. They're going to they're going to parrot everything that the parents have been saying, you know, like, be careful, you know, to the, to the little ones, like a five, six, seven year old is going to keep an eye out for a three year old, um, for the most part. Um, and you can, you can choose to let that type of interaction just unfold and develop naturally in a, in a, maybe a tense, a tense moment. But if you just let that scenario play out, you might see something beautiful develop amongst your child and a, and a, and another stranger child that now becomes a friend, you know, and then there's an opportunity for friendship and relationship building, um, on the playground. So yeah, parents lighten up, will you? <laughs> well, as if there's not already enough to be stressed about, like when you're talking, I was thinking about how many things we have to protect our children from, you know, mm -hmm. there's just a heightened sense of, fear and uh, you know with everything that's going on it's like we've had to keep our guard up and to me it feels freeing to know that there is a space for him to play 
an explorer without me having to interfere. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if parks and playgrounds are going to be those spaces, then I think that's, you know, that that's a, a place worth, um, worth caring for, worth investing in, worth um, designing for, um, because it really is, it's not just, it is about your kid, but it's not just about them. It's about like the entire community and making sure that like mm -hmm. many different people can, can enjoy those parks, right? One of the things that we had talked about before this, as we were kind of planning around this conversation is how many of our playgrounds kind of across the country, they're very cookie cutter, right? Like you kind of know what to expect. Um, and I think it's very location dependent, but there's also kind of this new wave of really cool, creative playgrounds. And I know you are like a part of that. I know that, you know, landscape structures is like really changing the game when it comes to creating these not only innovative playgrounds, but also accessible, inclusive playgrounds. And so I want to kind of shift into that and talk about the, some of the creative ways that we can make our playgrounds feel more inclusive for people of, you know, different cultures, backgrounds, um, ethnicities, race, and just kind of be more intentional about the design of our spaces so that um, people can visit and feel like it's made for them or like it represents them. So do you want to kind of talk about your approach to this, what you've seen and share some examples? Totally. Um, I think as we talk about playgrounds and parks specifically, um, you know, the park is a large plot of land, right? Um, we can talk about accessibility from like the macro picture of like what is an accessible park. That could be making sure that there are sidewalks, making sure that bathrooms are close to the parking lot, making sure that there are changing stations in the men's and women's restrooms so that parents can change their little one's diapers if they need it. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of just different, um, things could come up if we talk about an inclusive and accessible park, um, on a playground, for example, if we're, if we're trying to consider the physical and sensory disabilities that some of our children might be dealing with on a playground, um, how are we going to make it easy for a child that might use a mobility device like a wheelchair or a walker, um, to participate in the same types of play as able-bodied children. Um, how do we want to make sure that children that might have, uh, you know, a physical disability are comfortable if they have a sensory disability, do we have spaces where they can decompress if they get overstimulated? Uh, do we have shade on the playground? Because some children that have physical disabilities and adults that have physical disabilities, they, they, it's difficult, their, their cooling regulation systems might be affected by their disability. So there are a lot of different things to consider. Um, but I'm going to just talk a little bit more about playgrounds specifically and how we can make them accessible, inclusive for ability level. Like if we're talking about the actual physical ability of a person and also an inclusion, uh, if we're thinking about cultural inclusion of minorities and people of color and uh communities that want to have their you know the the culture of the people living in that community represented represented in the park and in the play space so um i think i'll just if you want we'll play a cool video in just a second um this park is called paco sanchez park and um it's in colorado this has a really cool story and we'll talk about it in the, uh, yeah, there we go. So we got Paco Park. It might be playing right now. And if we got audio, that's fine. If we don't, that's cool too. But uh, the playground was designed after a microphone, uh, an old school microphone. 
Um, if there is no audio, that's Hold on. Cool, but... Broadcasting, that's going to be our theme. I mean, we talked to lots of different playground manufacturers, and then we talked to Landscape Structures and Rocky Mountain Rec and come up with what you're seeing now, this mic power concept. And so it's really cool because there's ways to interact with it like we didn't even think of. So there's like kids saying, hey, there's a secret passage here. And, and there's some different levels of challenge. So users of all ages, little kids to adults, have been uh, experiencing the power, which has been really cool. There's so many different ways to play on the structure. It's been great to watch. I really like it. It's like an obstacle. It's just huge, the, the slide's fun, it does a lot of stuff. I like the side because it's super big. It's actually really cool, like a lot of ways, like a lot of less stuff to do so you never get bored. I'm 11, I still like that. Look, look at me, I'm going. I like spending time with my kids and this is fun. I like the design, I like the... I'm just going to pause that right there, so... Um, we, we, we just saw adults in there, we saw kids of all ages, um, if you want to pop back to the video or to the screen of the video. That's a large ramp that's actually connected to uh, a walkway. So if you are in a wheelchair or a mobility device or you're uh, just older and you want to have this elevated experience, which all kids enjoy the a change in elevation and perspective, um, you're able to go across this easily accessible elevated ramp um, and I'm gonna the keep structure, and, you know, you can climb and very physical, even for adults. So there you can see the parking lot to the right and you have that elevated ramp all the way across to the main structure of the playground. What we would call that, you know, that's an accessible path, universal access. So people of all abilities can get out to the hub of the playground. That is where all the kids are running around. So if you're an older grandparent and you just want to be in the midst of it all, you can be there if you're in a wheelchair. Um, you can transfer down to a playground or to one of the slides that are coming off of that and uh, enjoy uh, the sliding experience. Um, but as you look at the entire park itself, um, this park has lots of capacity other than just the playground. You've got a wonderful green space where people can uh, set up picnics or you know, play soccer, ultimate Frisbee. They're in Colorado. So I bet there's a lot of Frisbee playing. I'm just kidding. I love Colorado used to live there and I played ultimate Frisbee. So I can, I can attest to that, but you've also got a lot of shade trees all around here, natural shade everywhere um, that make it a comfortable and also beautiful space for people to interact with nature. Um, if we want to jump over to the next screen yeah so let's just pause here real quick um this is this is uh, martin luther king park in uh, hammond indiana so just looking at this perspective of the playground you know we've got two separate sections of the playground one for two to five years old and one for five to twelve years old um and it just looks like a normal playground um from this perspective but I want you to, as we pay closer attention to the details um, of this park, I'll, I'll drop a, I'll pause a few things. Um, but look at the surfacing, look at the actual features themselves. We're gonna see a lot of cool little Easter eggs hidden throughout this playground that are going to um, be a, it's, it's, it's a really exciting thing to see a playground like this where you have an opportunity for direct education for kids on a very sensitive subject like civil rights. So this playground has a bunch of really cool stuff and a really great opportunities to play and be physical, but also to pause and stop and have a moment of learning with the parent. Um, so let's just let this roll.
fun different things that you can do when you first see it. You're like, I don't even know what to do first. Yeah, I like the Martin Luther King one back yeah, there. Because even though it's a playground and you can play on it, it still has a little bit of history so you can do something else in case you might not like playing on a playground. They help us learn. They help us learn more about the past and how things were. And a lot of people like learning about the past. I, for one, love learning about Martin Luther King Jr. To our knowledge, this is the only park like this that has something honoring uh, African American uh, inventors. I enjoy just sitting here watching the kids because of the number of kids and the number of uh, parents that were here with their kids. And it was, it was just very, very uh, exciting. My name is Adeline and I am nine years old and I really, really like this swing. My name is Keesley and I'm five and I like about this park. It, it's fun because it slides. I'm Noah and my name is Seth. <laughs> no. <laughs> and I like the swing jumping. My name is Alina and I'm 10 years old and my favorite thing, or one of my favorite things, is the signs of history. Oh. Oh, that was just lovely, wasn't it? Um, I'm going to share my screen real quick um, for just a little more details on this playground here. Um, and the there it is. So during that video, there's, you know, kids are just having fun. Um, from a designer perspective, just want to talk about the different things that we see here. Um, imprinted in, this, in the play panel right up front, this image of Martin Luther King. Um, and it's at the, on top of a, the summit of a mountaintop. So this is uh, alluded to one of his quotes where he talks about he's come down on the mountaintop and I'll, I'll show you that more detail. Um, but just look at the colors, you know, lots of reds, yellows, and greens. Um, and those are incorporated in the Pan-African uh, movement, which represent um, a lot of the, the, uh, uh, I guess I guess I'm I'm blanking here. Uh, red, yellow, and green represent the uh, Ethiopian flag, um, but you know the green, greens, yellows, reds are very important during Black History Month. Um, if you look deeper into the playground, there is actually a bus. This is on two to five. What is that? That's the bus boycotts. Rosa Parks up front. Um, here's the picture of the mountaintop talking about, but it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., right? Um, in the the previous video, or when we were showing the video, um, there was, mm, I think I might've missed it. Um, but throughout the throughout the playground, there are these opportunities for learning with QR codes that will take you to different YouTube videos and educational uh, websites to talk about the different events uh, that have happened through the civil rights movement. Um, if we can go back to the video, uh, I would like to point out just one thing that I thought is pretty unique. There it was. Um, potentially if I can bounce through it, I apologize. There it is. So in the stairs of the playground, there is a whole section of staircase climbers with African-American authors uh, and the, the spines of the books are shown in there. So kids can get interested in that book and maybe they'll read that book. Um, there was a, so down there at the bottom, that climber, that's the Edmund Pettus bridge uh, climber, and if you're not familiar with the Edmund Pettus Bridge, that's the bridge 
uh, that Martin Luther King and a lot of civil rights activists marched across from in Selma, Alabama, on their way to the capital of Montgomery, right? Um, and it's very interesting to have the the bridge feature there also described in the playground surface. So you've got the river that the bridge was covering, Edmund Pettus Bridge. The name, I believe, is is actually built into this. I'm trying to find it. Sorry for all the click clacking around. Um, I might not find it. Um, but they even name they named the bridge um, on on this playground. And that might bring up a conversation. Um, you can exit out of the video uh, about who Edmund Pettus was. Edmund Pettus was uh, a Confederate general that was also in the Ku Klux Klan that the bridge was named after. Yet that bridge is known for one of like the key moments in the civil rights march or in the, after the civil rights movement. Um, so you're going to get some opportunities for difficult conversations that kids are going to ask these questions. They're going to say, who's Edmund Pettus? And say, oh, oh, OK, well, let's navigate these waters and let's use the playground and the different educational panels across the playground to talk about what the civil rights movement was. Um, yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah, well, I think not only is it a good opportunity, learning opportunity for the kids who, you know, may not know about it, but it's, I think what you're saying about having that maybe difficult conversation and opening up that dialogue is, is something that we don't expect for our playgrounds to do. And I think it really is an opportunity for, for parents and their kids to, to bond in that moment. And also for the parents to kind of relearn or unlearn some things as we go, because there's a lot that happens at our playgrounds that we maybe don't see. And I think the beautiful part about it that you were mentioning earlier is around that relationship building and kids, they don't care who they're playing with as long as they're nice, right? Like we don't have those biases when we're children. Um, and so it's, I think an amazing opportunity to be able to dive into the history of things, to not just feel like, oh, it's a place to, to go play and run around and get all your energy out. But like this place can teach our children, you know, empathy, um, uh, understanding um, the history. There's just so much that comes out of it, but it, it does start with that intentional design and the willingness for your park to be to be that place and it that involves you know taking a stand and realizing that it's important because you're not just putting a cookie cutter playground there you're you're customizing this experience based on your local history and i think it's mm -hmm. it's really cool yeah uh, and, and going on more about local history i'll share my screen again um, this is a park and it's called Lincoln Heights in Southern California. And they have a, uh, you know, large Latino community there. So they did an entire playground that had a Dia de los Muertos theme. Um, just beautiful aesthetics, bright, vibrant colors. Um, and landscape structures is able to use these, um, you know, these great aesthetics not only in just like the the printing. So what you can see right now, if you're listening, it's just a floral floral pattern that's that's been printed onto the actual plastic of a climber of the frame. So that's that's a little bit more of an aesthetic. But we can take the actual design. Moving to the next piece, you've got these uh, Mexican flags that you'll often see strung over the square. You know, in multi layers of these flags on the during the deal. Dia, Dia de los Muertos celebrations um, and other celebrations. But if you just look at the aesthetics in there, you got the flower theme, you've got the, the little bird theme in there. Um, and these are functional. Kids can put their hands and feet into these holes and climb on them. Um, same thing when we are looking, uh, this is just another perspective of those climbers, um, the Dia de los Muertos skull. And that's another climbing feature 
on there in the flowers that are all throughout uh, the Dia de los Muertos. You've got a lot of beautiful skulls in the flowers that are, you know, paying tribute to their, your ancestors that have passed. Um, and the level of detail that you can get with these types of manufacturing are the details that make a playground, you know, just a playground to a community like owning a space and feeling connected to a space and having pride in their space um, and being able to make something just absolutely stunning that's functional um, and pays homage to the culture that is living in this community. Um, that might not have been seen, you know, 10 years ago. They might mm -hmm. all have just been primary color playgrounds with stairs and slides and monkey bars, but this gives a totally different feel to the playground that um, I think allows for a young mind, even if, uh, you know, if you're a Caucasian kid playing on this playground, you're going to love this playground because of the bright, vibrant colors and the activities that are out there. But if you're a child that's of, uh, you know, uh, children of immigrants that came from Mexico, your parents are going are going to love this. Your grandparents are going to love this if they're living around this area and they're going to they're going to have fun just seeing something that's reflected themselves reflected in the in the space that they might not have seen before. Um, and I don't think you can put a, a price tag on that. Uh, like there's a, so much value from a community standpoint um, that these these types of details go a long way. Um, and I feel like I'm getting a little redundant here, but it, it's just really cool to see. Um, and then being able to put, you know, details into the shade too, so that as the, sh the light casts light through the shade, you're going to get these floral aesthetics on the ground as well. Um, so you got lots of different levels of uh, cultural uh, impact uh, influence on a playground like this. So think of, you know, let's say uh, in, in Gwinnett County, right? Um, there's a large Asian community there. We could do something very similar if it's Korean or if it's Chinese influence, you know, you can bring these design aesthetics to a park, to a playground where these people live and just give them something that is completely their own. And they have a great sense of pride knowing I live in this community where I'm reflected in the community space, as opposed to, you know, just your just your neighborhood of friends you can actually go out and have your culture be exposed to everybody mm -hmm. it's it's just really cool really cool to think about really cool to see um and i i uh i encourage a lot of people to watch this video <laughs> you know <laughs> hopefully hopefully you're you can watch the video and see these pictures because mm -hmm. if you're just listening to the podcast, this might be a boring part, but <laughs> it's probably watch the video. Not a great podcast, but a great video um, <laughs> because the visuals, the visuals add a lot. It's just like you're saying the visuals on the playground. It's the colors of it. It's seeing it. It's uh, experiencing it for yourself is really where the value comes in. Um, yeah. But I think just, you know, if this is your first introduction to some of those creative and innovative and inclusive playground designs, then just sit on this, rewatch this and see how many ideas that you can bring into your own community because everybody is different. Um, and, but that's the beautiful thing is that just like, imagine if all of our playgrounds were representative of the people that live there. Uh, it's a really beautiful, colorful experience that I, that all of our communities I think would really benefit from. So Thank you for sharing everything that you did today, Dustin. Really, really glad to have you back on the Let's Talk Park show. Um, a big thank you to Landscape Structures for sponsoring this episode and this video. And um, is there anything else that you'd like to leave us with or maybe how people can get in touch with you? Yeah, sure. If you want to uh, get in touch with me, um, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, you can also go to playgroundcreations.com, see some of the work we've done. Um, just one last thing to say, I guess, is, you know, don't forget that there's a small child inside of each of us adults. 
and let's let that little child out and play and have fun and remember what it's like to be free on a playground. Um, allow yourself that space for uh, to just take the weight of adulthood off your shoulders. Give yourself that at least once once a day and um, give your little kid a hug. Go do something that brings you joy. Have some good food with friends. Now I'm getting a little preachy, but like go to your park, see your friends at the park. You know, um, all my friends are starting to have kids, you know, so get get the crew together. Have a little high school reunion at the park playground. Just have a good time and uh, be good to each other. Yeah. Well, that's why we do this. That's why we work in parks and recreation, because it's amazing. And so we, we always need that reminder for ourselves. So thank you, Justin. Oh, yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. Until next time. Let's talk parks. Bye. Bye.